Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today for the first online roundtable of the Malaria Game Changers series. My name is Joost Wagner, and I'm going to be your moderator. As you can see, I'm calling in from Bangkok, and we are expecting to have about 200 or more people joining us for the session today. But before we go right into our first edition of the Game Changer series, I would like to ask Dr. Marie Lamy from the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance uh, to give us some background about this new series. Dr. Marie. Hi, Joost. Thank you very much for this. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, many of us are connected here today because we're either working in or interested in public health. Uh, as we know, the Asia Pacific um, region committed to eliminating malaria by 2030. But efforts to eliminate malaria really go hand in hand with improving regional health security against other infectious diseases as well, like dengue, like COVID-19. To fight these diseases, um, what we know is that we need timely access to health commodities, whether it is drugs, vaccines, or even diagnostic tests. COVID-19 has disrupted our lives in many ways. Um, one example of that is the impact of the restriction on the movement and, of goods and people on the production and the supply of other essential health commodities like for malaria. In fact, the current situation really has placed the topic of access to health innovations quite high up on the political agenda. Um, we've seen that through activities and debates around new treatments, vaccines, even protective equipment for COVID-19, uh, and discussions on how to get those to patients quicker and to health workers. So when it comes to the 2030 elimination goal for malaria, we know that health innovations are really a key part of the puzzle. For this reason, um, we at APOMA decided to join up with several partners to set up the Malaria Game Changers. Um, this will be a series of online roundtables during which we will talk about the role of innovations in improving health security in general, and also in sustaining progress to malaria elimination in Asia Pacific. So during these roundtables, we invite experts, senior officials, product developers, and others to exchange thoughts about new tools and strategies to advance health security. Um, so this is a five part online roundtable series that will take place between now and December and focus on different topics like vector control, new treatments against drug resistance and even medicine quality or diagnostic tests for today. So for this roundtable today, we've partnered with the RBM partnership and malaria and with FIND um, and we're really excited to kickstart the discussion with you. So that's it from me. Thank you, Jost. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Marie Lamy. And this is the very first round table of the series on diagnostics for febrile illness. So this round table is actually being hosted by APLMA, by the RBM Partnership to End Malaria and by FIND. And our discussions today will revolve around a couple of key points. So we want to highlight the importance of finding and treating every case of malaria. We are going to elaborate on existing products and strategies to detect malaria cases. We explore the question, what new tests are available to get to elimination and other products to detect the last cases. And we will talk about integrated fever management. So let's start our series with some welcome remarks. And I have the pleasure to welcome Professor Kamini Mendes. Professor Emeritus Kamini Mendes is a Sri Lankan malaria expert medical doctor, researcher, and public health professional. She has decades of experience in malaria control and elimination and serves on several international boards and committees on health. And she's also on the member board of directors for the Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance. So thank you very much, Dr. Kamini, for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you, Joost. Um, uh, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you today to the first round table of the Malaria Game Changes Innovation Series. I'd like to say a warm welcome to all the panelists and the audience to this first round table on diagnostics for febrile illnesses. 
So uh, let me make a few introductory remarks about this round table. Uh, as we all know, the very first step in managing any infectious disease is diagnosing it. And that is why this round table focuses on the role of diagnostic tests. With malaria, it's no different. When a malaria patient presents to the health system, often with symptoms of fever, it could be any infectious disease. It could be dengue, it could be COVID-19, or one of many others, because they all have very similar symptoms. So the first thing to know is to know if it is due to a malaria infection or not. And if it is, what type of malaria it is, because the treatment and management of the patient will depend very much on knowing what type of malaria is causing that infection. Now, as a public health community, we also, also recognize the importance of fast and accurate diagnos diagnosis in dealing with the current epidemic of uh, COVID-19. Most fever cases like malaria or COVID-19 can be detected fast with the help of rapid diagnostic tests, which are available today. Now, the questions we will touch on during this round table are also about the integrated management of fever, diagnosing fevers, whatever they are due to, and making sure that the patients receive adequate care. The panelists will explain the importance of strengthening our health systems and training our healthcare workers to support the management of all infectious diseases. And diagnostics, uh, as was said before, diagnostic tests have a very important role to play in this effort. So with those few remarks, I think I'll hand it over back to you, Ayast. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamini. And we will hear more from you in a short while because you will also join in the panel. So let me say a few remarks about how we're gonna run this online round table. So we, or the organizers actually, have invited a number of experts and you are already seeing them all on their webcam. And I have the pleasure to ask them a number of questions, more or less I have prepared two questions for each of them. And then the remaining time we will dedicate for engaging with you, the audience. So I think you are seeing a chat box. I don't see the chat box, but I think you have a chat box. So please make heavy use of the chat box. And you can not only write comments and uh, thoughts, but you can also write questions there. And there are some colleagues who are trying to help me to filter out the most interesting and most relevant questions for, for us today. However, if you have a question to a specific speaker, um, then please mention the speaker at the beginning so it helps us to address the right person if you have a question. So without further ado, I would like to introduce now uh, our speakers. I mean, you already heard Dr. Kamini. Uh, let me start with from Vietnam, Dr. Nhu Duk Tang. He's the head of epidemiology at the Department of the National Institute of Malariology, Parasitology, and Entomology at the Ministry of Health in Vietnam. Welcome, Dr. Tang. Um, we have with us today Dr. Sydney Yi. She's the CEO of the Diagnostics Development Hub in Singapore and also a senior advisor at Accelerate. And her team of diagnostics and medical device specialists at the hub were the first to receive provisional authorization of COVID-19 tests from the Health Science Authority in early February in Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. And she brings a lot of extensive uh, experience in research and development. And she has started many co uh, companies and investments and has been actively involved in medtech and innovation activities. Welcome, Dr. Sydney. Also with us and also co-host today, on behalf of FIND, Dr. Sabine Dittrich, I think you are in Geneva normally based. She has a strong background in malaria and non-malarial research and has spent five years in the Lao PDR. And is, as a principal investigator with the University of Oxford studying non-malarial fevers, but she has also published extensively in many relevant journals on malaria and non-malarial fevers. Welcome, Dr. Sabine. Then I would like to go to Japan and I welcome Mr. Junji Arita. Arita-san is a manager of global business development at Icon Chemicals. And Arita-san has been with 
the company since 2008. Welcome. And then last but not least, Dr. Yang Shik Cho is a chairman of the board of directors of SD Biosensor. Dr. Cho has held the position of the president and the CEO of the company from 2014 to 2017. And Dr. Cho has been engaged in development of tests and rapid tests, for example, for SARS-CoV-2, PCR tests, Zika, Ebola, MERS, H1N1, H5N1, and SARS coronavirus. Welcome, Dr. Cho. And you might notice I have not mentioned one person because we are going to have another welcome remark. And I have the honor to actually to introduce you to the Ambassador for Regional Health Security of Australian Department for Foreign Affairs and Trade, Dr. Stephanie Williams. And she is also an expert by herself. She is trained as a public health physician and epidemiologist. And before assuming the role as ambassador, she has been the principal specialist for health at the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade since 2017, but also in previous roles she worked as an epidemiologist in global health security for the World Health Organization. I think you also worked for Médecins Sans Frontières um, and WHO on malaria treatment policy in Myanmar. So a real expert. Welcome, Ambassador. Over to you. Thank you, um, Professor Mendes, fellow panelists and colleagues. Thank you very much for the opportunity to open this series of webinars, The Malaria Game Changers to highlight, as has been said, the importance of innovation in pursuing our disease elimination goals and pursuing health outcomes globally. This is a very important and welcome joint initiative from FIND, Rollback Malaria and Appleman, and terrific to start with diagnostics. And I think Professor uh, Mendes has already captured the, the essence of why new diagnostics are essential to any public health challenge. Diagnostics are as close as possible to the patient, as useful as possible for the clinician, and as affordable and accessible as possible for the system. And we've known a lot about this for malaria for decades, and the COVID-19 pandemic has illustrated, um, has really brought these principles into light and highlighted the need in this new disease. And I think if, we ref if I reflect briefly, during COVID-19, we have seen innovation at huge scale and speed for the new vaccines, for, for research into treatments and diagnostics. And I think the fact that the global health community started down this path of product development and product access decades ago, led by communities such as the malaria community and TB and FINE, has actually provided a critical foundation and a platform which for, uh, onto which this COVID research and development has, has really launched from. But at the same time, as has been said, we cannot take our gaze off malaria elimination and the importance of timely and continuous access to commodities. I'm really looking forward to the topic today about the uh, febrile illness in particular, because it will um, it's an excellent illustration of how thinking broadly about multiple diseases for as many outcomes as possible can really continue to spearhead innovation. Australia as a development partner and as a participant in the global health community has a key role in, in helping to both finance the development of these technologies and, and support their delivery. And we're a very proud partner of FIND, of MMV, of the TV Alliance and IVCC, as well as CEPI. We also recognise that the product as essential as it is needs a pathway to the patient. And so we're a proud supporter of regulatory strengthening in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, Madam Chair, I'm really looking, ma 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 Madam Chair, I'm looking forward to this discussion and I'm so excited to see our collection of panellists here. Um, and I don't want to stand any more in the way of this important discussion. So thank you very much for the, the opportunity to open the webinars and back to you, Jost. Thank you, Dr. Stephanie, and thank you very much for, and I think we all appreciate the support of the Australian government to try to help the world to end malaria. So let's go straight into the heart of our discussion and uh, let's try to understand why diagnostic tests are a key part of our efforts to eliminate malaria and also to improve health security in the region. I would like to ask the first question to Dr. Tang from Vietnam. Dr. Tang, COVID-19 has shown us the importance of identifying new cases quickly. This is valid for malaria elimination too, right? 
So yeah. especially as we approach elimination and we aim to stop its transmission completely. So why is testing a key to fighting an infectious disease and why it is so important to surveillance efforts and to effectively controlling and eventually eliminating a disease like malaria? Okay. Dr. Thank you, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, very uh, uh, interesting questions. Uh, so uh, for malaria and also uh, COVID-19 travel, uh, we see that um, very important to test, cheat, and track every single case in uh, order to clear a reservoir. So, uh, so that we need to mass screen to test for a risk group. And uh, we also uh, um, uh, see that the country uh, that successful uh, control the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, that the country uh, quickly uh, increase their ability to test and conduct uh, rigorous monitoring to check who may be exposed to the disease. Um, is a country where they did not focus on stepping, then it has been very hard to control the virus. Uh, in order to, uh, we need to test COVID first. Uh, the same uh, is true for malaria and also you know, other diseases. Uh, in Vietnam, uh, to uh, five more than 300 uh, COVID-19 cases. We need to test thousands of people and we find every case so we can uh, control and eliminate the disease. And uh, in Vietnam, uh, we this is with COVID and we plan uh, to do the same with malaria. And we, we think we can apply for uh, malaria animation as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tang, for starting the conversation here. And I would like to follow up straight with Dr. Sidney Yi, who is currently based in Singapore to elaborate on the concept of diagnosis and finding cases. Dr. Sidney, in your professional opinion, can we really find every case? And is that what we are realistically aiming for? Uh, thank you, Jos, uh, for the question. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, I, I could, uh, I'll speak from the perspective of and the experience of Diagnostics uh, Development Hub, where we, the goal of DXD Hub, DXD Hub being a national platform of Singapore, the goal of DXD Hub is really to look at innovations. And I think Dr. Stephanie and Dr. Kamini talked about how important, how important innovations and, and diagnostics are in dealing with the uh, really treatment in any uh, uh, or management of any infectious diseases. So taking the innovations and turning that into, making that into a diagnostics product. So building on the experience that we've had um, in the last few months, just focusing on COVID-19, we have launched uh, quite a number of products, diagnostics. And I said that because um, uh, just looking at that, is we're not just talking about testing. I think uh, testing, everyone agrees, in order to, to manage to treat the first thing you need to do is to test, is to diagnose, is to find. But there are many different ways of doing that. Um, there are many different situations that would render different needs of the test that we need to have. And therefore, in so we see that in how we have had to deploy different diagnostics tests for uh, COVID-19 alone. So we are talking about rapid tests and we're talking about um, uh, not just molecular lab-based tests, but also different variation of the lab-based test. Because uh, if we all remember just a few months ago, um, uh, we had the supply chain difficulties in reagents. And suddenly, even if you had the RT-PCR, conventional PCR test, there's nothing you can do because there's no RNA extraction reagent. So, you know, so then uh, uh, we now just uh, deploy another one that is completely extraction free. So there are many different types of testing that need to be um, deployed and used for different situations. At the end of the day, we are also talking about different population. There's a population that's higher risk, 
that's medium risk that is uh, you know lower risk and are we talking about uh, testing the population for uh, aggressive um, uh, management and treatment purposes or testing a population for surveillance purposes because uh, in the context of a pandemic at the end of that we are well, you know we're now talking about also going back to work so so there's a whole range of of uh, management and solutions that we're talking about that uh, will be entirely based on testing so so i think that's really what we're talking about when we put in context of diagnostics Thank you, Dr. Sidney. And okay, I understand now correctly, diagnostic tests are an important part of our disease surveillance efforts. Dr. Sabine, how can diagnostic tests, including rapid diagnostic tests, or in short, RDTs, actually help us to understand disease trends and be better prepared actually to respond mm -hmm. to health security threats? Thank you, Jules, that's a great question. And I'm just gonna follow up from my colleagues. What we've heard before, I think everybody agrees, um, diagnostic is essential and diagnostic is sort of at the center of any, any surveillance strategy. And, and really the, the reason is because if we don't know what, what the numbers are, if we don't understand what the, what the data are for malaria, but also for other infectious diseases, it's very hard to understand when there's more of one thing or less of one thing. And that's when we need to look and trigger some, some action, public health action. So that's really um, where diagnostic is absolutely critical. And, um, and that's where data are absolutely critical. And I'm gonna to come to that. But um, RDTs in that context, so rapid diagnostic tests, you know, the advantage of an RDT is that you can use it really widely. Um, and, and, and really what it differentiates itself from other diagnostic, from lab-based diagnostics is that, well, as the name says, a lab-based diagnostics, you need a lab, you need infrastructure, and you need a, a lot of trained personnel normally. An RDT you can use really widely and you can try to decentralize diagnostic testing. And that's the beauty and that's the, the huge advantage that we've had in the malaria community for the last 10 years. Um, that we have this tool that we can use outside of a, um, outside of a laboratory that we can go into the community and really test. But one thing that's really critical about surveillance and about diagnostic in that context, when we talk about um, surveillance and, and using the data, is really making sure that the data that we generate are getting back to where the decisions are made. And um, that has to happen also for RDTs. That has to happen for lab-based tests. It's critical that we harness those data points and bring them back to the central um, central organization, central place, wherever the decisions are made to take public health action. So in addition to having good diagnostic tests, which we need and which we've had, and we you know there's still room for improvement for malaria, but, but we've been lucky in that respect um, for that, that we have had RDTs, but we really need to make sure that the data that we generate with those RDTs are being fed back um, and are really informing the surveillance because only then is the diagnostic that we have really informing the surveillance system. Let me dig a little bit deeper, Dr. Sabine. So can you explain to us what we have learned in our efforts to develop mm -hmm. better malarial rapid diagnostic tests and how can these lessons, and I think that's of interest to many of our attendees today, how these lessons helped inform the development of COVID-19 diagnostics? That's a great question. And I, would, I, I totally agree. I think we've learned a huge deal, but I don't want to say that we've, we, you know, we've reached the, the peak and we know it all. Um, so I want to be absolutely clear that while we've learned a lot, we need to keep, you know, we need to keep our eye on the end goal and, and particularly, you know, malaria elimination and, and how we need to improve upon the in innovations we have. But how have we learned? So let me just sort of give a couple of examples. Um, We've had malaria RDTs, as I've said, um, for about 10 years and the test and treat policy from the WHO has been in place for that time period. And really over that time, we've learned a huge deal in terms of um, quality assurance. FIND has played a critical role over the last years um, with the WHO um, and how we, how, what does quality mean for, for these RDTs? How do we need to ensure quality? Um, how can we continuously test, um, you know, with post-market surveillance with other activities? How can we make sure that these tests are really um, of high quality when they reach the end user, particularly because they can reach so far out into the community? We've learned a huge deal about 
procurement, supply chains, and all of these things that are critical, as we've heard before, and that were, have been challenges for for COVID now um, that we face. But but we have we we've we've got these infrastructures that we've learned from training. We know that even though RDTs, rapid malaria tests, are very straightforward in theory but they can be very tricky to use still when you're in the field when you when you don't have perfect lighting conditions and so on so we can already think about those things now where, where the development is ongoing for COVID-19 tests for antigen tests that, that you know where the plan is as Dr. Sidney said to use them in different settings we can apply those learnings and really go back and 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 you know think about the, the implementation challenges that we faced at the time and make sure that we address them right now. And for us anyway, I find this has been, you know, we are trying to apply all of these learnings and all of these from all the different aspects from, uh, from the development, because also um, we've learned over the years that we need highly sensitive RDTs, much more, more sensitive, particularly for PVIVAX than we have at the moment. So that's really where, you know, the innovation needs to push further. Um, and, and the technology, and we will probably hear, hear about that from our colleagues from, from ICANN and, and SD Biosensor, you know, the technology to develop to make these highly sensitive tests is not straightforward. And, um, and, and all the leading malaria RDT developers are, you know, are also at the forefront of, of other febrile illness diagnostic tests. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure that the learnings here can also be translated from the technology, you know, in the lab, in the, in the, in the development um, pathways. So certainly a lot of learnings to be taken forward for COVID and a lot of febrile, other febrile illnesses, because certainly those two are not the only ones in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and and um, as, as the co-chair of the ACT A accelerator for COVID, which is really trying to push diagnostic um, agenda for COVID-19, we're taking them all on board at FIND and, and um, you know, moving things forward. So, so thank you for the question. It's really a lot to learn, a lot though more to do. Thank you, Dr. Zabina. So let's zoom in on malaria for a few minutes to try and understand the role of diagnostic tests in the fight against this old disease that bothers us here in the Asia Pacific and beyond, of course. Testing for malaria is part of the solution, I understand. So diagnostic tests are available broadly through public health facilities, but also often through the private sector facilities. So what do we know about success, sorry, successful ways to reach patients and diagnose malaria cases in the Asia and the Pacific? And to answer this question, I would like to go over to Dr. Kamini and ask her about her views. Um, thank you, Just. Um, so as we've all heard in the past few minutes, diagnostic tests for malaria are an extremely important component of the elimination effort. In fact, the diagnostic tests is the largest malaria commodity in terms of procurement volume uh, with more than 400 million units distributed globally uh, in a year. So this is, these are large quantities that have been used so far. Uh, rapid diagnostic tests for malaria, which we call RDTs for short, have been the first point of care tests to be distributed on a massive scale uh, in malaria. Uh, they have also been the reason, together with effective medicines and insecticide-treated bed nets, uh, that were responsible for drastically reducing malaria cases in the Asia-Pacific over the last uh, 15 years or so. So diagnostic tests for malaria, like for many other infectious diseases, are the first step towards adequate clinical management <clears throat> and help to guide proper treatment. So it's, it's, important, it's an important tool for surveillance, but it's also a very important tool for clinical management. The WHO guidelines on this are very clear. Quality diagnostics are needed to test suspected malaria cases before administering treatment. And RDTs offer a simple and rapid way of doing this, even in the most remote areas of the Asia Pacific region. Now, um, Sri Lanka, my own country, it's a country that eliminated malaria in 2012. And one of the important diagnostic tools it used for malaria diagnosis was in fact microscopy. But when RDTs became available, 
they were widely used, especially in remote and rural areas where microscopy may not have been readily available. Microscopy, the traditional, the conventional way of, of diagnosing malaria before RDTs came into being, requires um, highly trained staff. And it can be only reliable if this, the person who's reading it uh, is highly trained. And so they're not always available everywhere where malaria patients present, especially in rural remote areas where most of the malaria burden lies today. For these reasons, it's important that quality tests for malaria and other febrile illnesses are made as widely available as possible, especially at the point of care, <clears throat> whether it's in the public sector, or I would say particularly in the private sector. So uh, I think that hopefully answers your question, Yost. Yes, Professor Kamini. And um, I think I will come back to you one more time later. Uh, but I have another short question to Dr. Zabine because I, I think we are seeing a downward trend in terms of the number of tests conducted, right? And this can be probably due to the um, to less systematic disease surveillance, especially as countries approach uh, elimination. So what innovative, innovative ways are we using to improve testing rates and keep close watch on malaria? Um, you have to unmute your mic, Dr. Sabine. Classic, classic mistake. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that's a great question because that is indeed what we've what what has been happening in many countries and in, in the Asia Pacific. And in a way, it's it's really um, a great thing because it means it's it's sort of a uh, the success of the malaria elimination has led to the result is that not too many malaria tests are positive. But I think we can all we all know um, when we are sick ourselves. Um, hearing that we don't have one disease is maybe not necessarily helping us. So you know, one reason for patients not presenting and getting tested for malaria might be because they already know they don't have malaria. And therefore, a large number of these malaria health work, um, the, the community health worker networks and village malaria and volunteers that were set up specifically for malaria, they now sort of in a, a little bit of a limbo situation. Um, and that's something that we, we hear from, from a lot of countries in, in the Asia Pacific region. But um, I, I give you an example from Myanmar that was really nicely documented in a, um, where, where um, um, Medical Action Myanmar, an NGO in Myanmar who's, who's um, supporting a number of large um, community health worker networks, what they've looked, they have looked at their data and what they saw over, over five years, that sort of the numbers of patients presenting to the, to, to the, to the village malaria um, workers was going down. And, and then obviously the testing numbers were going down. And we've all learned this over the last weeks with co coronavirus, that we need to test, we need to test. And the, the more we test, we will find, and this is similar for malaria. And um, so the testing numbers were going down in these in these village malaria networks. And when they introduced um, additional services, so now these 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 workers were not only there for malaria anymore. They were they were providing additional care. They were helping triage patients for TB. Um, and and suddenly, it was like they the numbers were going up again. And, 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 it, and, and, you know, we can only hypothesize why that happened, but I, I would think it's, it has a huge part and a huge part to do with the fact that now a patient was treated as a, as a, you know, in an integrated way as a, as a, for their disease and not just for one thing. Now they were going to these health workers and they were getting care. <laughs> um, and that's really an innovative way of going out and introducing diagnostics and thinking about the health system that I think can help us um, increase surveillance for malaria and, and continue the push for testing for malaria. Now, in addition to that, we have to, you know, we can, we can find these innovative ways of of, of integrating malaria into a bigger system. But we also can do that on one specific test. And I think we will hear from um, SD Biosense so how they've done this for one specific um, S, um, test that is combined with CRP, malaria with CRP, but also for other tests that are sort of combining multiple febrile illness diseases um, to help give information that the patient needs so they can get the appropriate treatment, even if it is not malaria. So that's a way of hopefully over the next years, we can increase the numbers again and we can encourage people to get care and seek care for a fever. Thank you, Sabine. And I think uh, I should remind our audience that 
I don't want to be the only one who's asking difficult questions to our panelists. So if you are watching our online roundtable, you can log in as a guest. I think you just have to press two buttons and then you can see other people's questions or comments or you can ask your own questions. And my colleagues will later steer a number of difficult questions to me, which I will of course give on to our panelists. So don't be shy, make use of our chat box. So we touched on the importance of diagnostic tests and also on the types of tests that we are already using in the region to diagnose malaria. But as we approach elimination, we also need to find the cases that do not show symptoms. I think that's a challenge, right? And the question is, what are we missing to make that possible? So to start us off on the topic of new products, and we have colleagues from the private sector here, um, to start us off, let us hear from Professor Kamini again, maybe um, to set the scene, and then I will go to Arita San and Dr. Cho to hear from their innovative approaches. Professor Kamini. You also have to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Yost. So you asked about this difficult uh, problem in malaria of some patients, uh, some people with malaria infections being um, asymptomatic, not having symptoms. So they don't know that they're sick and they, they can't present themselves for treatment yet uh, they have the malaria parasite in them and they can infect other people, mosquitoes and other people. So what do we do about them? Well, they are a challenge um, because they carry very low density parasites, still can infect others. Um, and, uh, uh, and so we need uh, perhaps better tests uh, which can detect uh, very small numbers of parasites in the patient. Uh, much more sensitive tests than we have today uh, to, to diagnose them. But having said that, I, I do not think asymptomatic cases should be the major focus of elimination efforts uh, because in many countries that, that have eliminated malaria, they've shown that the focus should be on providing diagnosis and treatment facilities to all symptomatic malaria patients first which many countries, I'm afraid, are still unable to do in an equitable, equitable fashion. So when you do that, and also use mosquito control methods like bed nets and, and spraying and so on, malaria comes down. And when malaria comes down, the asymptomatic uh, proportion of asymptomatic people will also disappear. And this is exactly what the countries that have successfully eliminated malaria have found. But having said that, in some countries in the Asia Pacific region, because treatment facilities have been generally poor, there may be large numbers of asymptomatic patients and we need to do something about them. Um, they have to be actively detected because they will not come forward for treatment. So for this, we will need more sensitive point of care diagnostic tests to detect asymptomatic cases in the field. And I'm glad to say that several new products are being developed and uh, they will try to meet this need. Hopefully, we may have new, more effective point of care tests, which can detect lower levels of infection at an affordable cost. But I wouldn't advise any country to hold their breath and wait for this to start their elimination efforts. Even with the current rapid diagnostic test, we can eliminate malaria, as many countries have shown. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Kamini. And we have actually two representatives from the industry today with us. And they are working about uh, new technologies that exist to improve field detection of malaria in, in the Asia and the Pacific. And I would like go, to go first to Arita San from Icon Chemical. And uh, Arita San, I heard that you have developed a new tool that is called, let me check, Malaria Lamp. Could you speak a little bit about this technology for field detection of asymptomatic malaria infections during mass screening and treatment? Over to you, Arita-san. Okay, thank you very much, Yost. I'm Ginger Arita from Aking Chemical. So as Yost introduced, our company has developed together with FIND Malaria Lamp, which is molecular-based uh, diagnosis tool for malaria. So our test kit can detect malaria in general and by vax 
and perfect makers. So um, what good about molecular-based test is the high sensitivity if we compare to microscopy to RDT. So as you all know about the current test, which is available in the rural setting, has lower sensitivity, which couldn't uh, detect uh, malaria from asymptomatic uh, patient. So what good about molecular based test is, as I said, high sensitive, which is from one parasite per microliter from blood sample, which is the highest sensitivity, which is available commercially as IBD test. So Aiken um, developed uh, not only for laboratory use, but also for uh, people centered test. That means our test can be used in rural setting where microscopy and also RDT uh, can be performed. So Aiken, uh, we can uh, provide not only for diagnosis too, but also for surveillance too, with this high sensitive uh, malaria lamp. So what we have found in the field, um, for example, in uh, the study where we developed in Haichi or in Thailand um, using our technology for reactive surveillance. So we found that um, this technology can detect low density of malaria from asymptomatic malaria patients. That is good news for all malaria uh, people who is, uh, let's say, self suffering by malaria and who is waiting for the actual uh, program for elimination of malaria. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arita Sanan. I understand that you have implemented the malaria lamp method of diagnosis already in some countries and particularly in the Lao PDR, if I'm not mistaken. Can you share some of your experience? about implementing it in these countries, especially Laos? Okay, so uh, in Laos, we had uh, support from Japanese government, SATREPS is a project name. And then we did some surveillance and also study in Laos. And uh, we conducted the study which has been successfully finished. So um, in the part of the study, we found that uh, this product can detect many, asymptomat uh, many malaria from asymptomatic uh, patients. And we made some case index on them and then made uh, reactive surveillance in Lao to find more uh, potential risk malaria uh, in the community. And we could also find by using TB lamp many new uh, malaria cases, which couldn't found by RDT and microscopy. That is our finding. Thank you very much. So now we have heard about the uh, malaria lamp method. Now I would like to turn to our colleague from Vietnam, Dr. Tang again. Can you tell us more about other high sensitive diagnostic tests that are available to help us? I think Vietnam has some experience to share. Yeah, so uh, I think for, for the high sensitivity uh, uh, test, it's uh, very essential for malaria uh, control and elimination. Um, I uh, my colleague also mentioned uh, uh, for LAM, and uh, actually in Vietnam, uh, two years ago, we want also use the LAM in the film to test uh, for, for malaria patients. So I actually in the community, so we, 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 uh, we found more cases uh, from them. So uh, I think this, I think maybe it's an alternative in the future. Um, uh, nowadays, people always uh, talk about high sensitivity tests and even uh, uncha sensitivity tests. Uh, so, uh, Actually, um, recently I, 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 uh, I saw the um, high sensitivity test. It's made from uh, Korea. 
but only we take uh, fancy barroom. But in, in in Southeast Asia, uh, normally we have both uh, fancy barroom and viva, and sometimes also uh, monkey malaria. So uh, at the moment, no no uh, bed is available to 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 get for uh, both species, fancy barroom and viva. Um, and also, um, uh, like COVID, uh, asymptomatic transmission happened with uh, uh, also people with low transmission uh, and uh, with the carrier, they don't have the symptom. Uh, I think this is, is a barrier for, for malaria elimination. Um, I quite uh, interested in the idea of uh, the colleague. Uh, she just mentioned some minutes ago, Kamini. She, she said the uh, asymptomatic is not really a big problem because when we treat all the symptomatic and then malaria uh, gradually uh, go, uh, go down. Um, yeah, I think it's right. But uh, actually, in, in order to um, eliminate malaria quickly, we, we, we need to uh, diagnose for uh, asymptomatic people uh, and also uh, with the subpatent malaria with very low density. So um, I think with our uh, high uh, sanity RDT, uh, Vietnam malaria control program and also the other neighboring country. I think we uh, really have the challenge to to uh, to find the key and uh, to choose and also clear the reservoir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Tang. So now that we have heard about some new tools, we know that innovations go through quite a long process from ideation phase to actual phase. And part of that late stage process is making sure that new products are safe and swiftly evaluated for use and registered in the country. So we are lucky to have someone actually who brings all this experience to our online round table. And because she's working with regulatory authorities on expediting the registration of critical innovations like diagnostics for COVID-19. So I'm going back to Dr. Sydney. So how does your hub support companies through this sometimes cumbersome regulatory process? Thank you, Yas. Um, so uh, I guess uh, uh, where Singapore is, uh, we, we are fortunate to have a, um, um, well, lack of a better word, a progressive and a, um, a regulatory authority. I use that word because um, um, if you recall, um, when we're talking about dealing with uh, um, infectious diseases, dealing with pandemic and diagnostics, um, we are, uh, you know, the, all the panelists have mentioned um, uh, innovations. So when we're talking about innovations, innovative solutions. Um, a lot of times we, uh, we actually have to remember to educate uh, or to work with maybe I shouldn't use the word educate, but actually to, to familiarize our regulatory authority earlier, as early as possible, as we are developing the innovative solutions. Because uh, um, uh, by definition, because they are innovative, maybe there isn't a, an existing benchmark or standardized uh, standards for some of these tests to go by. So um, exposing them to some of these uh, solutions as early as possible actually gave you, um, a chance um, to work with the regulator and to um, to really interact. And uh, what we how we do it is uh, we play uh, an intersection between the public sector, the regulator, and the private sector, the companies, and sometimes uh, really the researchers as well. Uh, so what we do is uh, we would actually, um, from the experience of building products. Um, uh, make suggestion and proposals to the regulators of uh, what are some of the ways that we can address, um, for example, it could be a new tool um, uh, 
to diagnose uh, COVID-19, but using a very, very different technology platform, different from the LAM, the RT-PCR, the RDT, uh, 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 lateral flow uh, based type technology platform that we're used to. So what that means is uh, um, we have to then think about how do we standardize the detection of some interference. Um, whenever you deal with human samples, uh, you need to be able to differentiate whether you're actually testing the analytes versus you're testing a, you know, a, a background or whether the the, the workflow actually has uh, generated the uncertainty in the outcome of your test. So, so all that actually have to be taken very, very early on when you are thinking about developing a product. And we need to take all that questions to our regulator as early as possible. And together we come up with a solution and we would make a proposal and say, how do we, how about we, we, we test this this way and then they will come to propose. So it accelerated really the way that we um, have been able to to take product to market. Um, in the last uh, five months alone, we had deployed, I think, you know, four different products to market just for COVID-19. Um, and uh, that's a, to us a very, a very good lesson to learn, um, to be able to uh, have very innovative, very open-minded uh, and very educated um, uh, uh, regulatory authority. And it goes back to uh, what um, uh, Dr. Zabina uh, mentioned earlier, the standardization. Uh, especially when you have so many innovative solutions going out in such a short time, um, you do run across uh, qualities across, uh, you know, even RDT for COVID-19. There are so many different RDTs on the market. You, you know, you, you need to have a way to standardize the quality. And this is also something that uh, helps when we, when we interact with the regulator uh, as, as early as possible. Thank you, Sydney. So I'd like to continue the discussion briefly on new diagnostics that are relevant for malaria emanation in Asia and the Pacific. So the region has a very heavy burden of a type of malaria called relapsing malaria, right? Or Vivex malaria, which is a strain of malaria that comes back unless, unless it's wiped out of the liver stage. So this has huge implications for continued transmission. So to treat Vivex malaria safely, it is important to test whether the patient is G6PD deficient, or in lay terms, I think deficient of a very important enzyme that regulates various biochemical reactions in the body. I had to check before we started this online roundtable. So, and we have an expert here from SD Biosensor from Korea, Dr. Cho. May I turn to you with the next question? What else do we need to be aware of when dealing with administering treatment for? Vivex and what tools can help here? Uh, thank, thank you for a question. Uh, basically, uh, for eradication of uh, malaria Vivex. Uh, I think your microphone is very low. Can it's possible? Uh, can you hear? Okay. Can you hear? Um, more or less, it's a little bit low, but I think go ahead. Can you hear? Hello? Hello? Maybe I can ask the secretary to, to, to give us a go ahead. Yeah. Uh, for uh, eradication of malaria by infection, uh, we need uh, some uh, high sensitive malaria RDT test. And also, uh, before uh, treatment for malaria by we have to check the level of uh, some GXPD enzyme. Because uh, some areas such as uh, southeastern uh, country uh, population has uh, some deficiency of uh, GXPD enzyme. In that case, if uh, we uh, deliver some uh, uh, medicine such as uh, primakin and tepenokin, uh, uh, some patient cause some hemorrhoids because uh, some deficiency of uh, GXPD. Uh, causes some hemorrhoids. Therefore, we need uh, some um, check, some quantitative GXPD uh, level. And uh, currently, there are so many uh, malaria RDT tests, and also supplement is enough to uh, 
uh, everywhere, including African country in Asian country. But for the GXPD uh, testing uh, some device uh, already existed in the market, but the testing method is difficult. And also we need some instrument to, to check the GXPD level. And also uh, there is no some quantitative or some POC test. Uh, therefore, uh, PASS asked us to develop some POC GXPD uh, test. And therefore we have worked with the PASS maybe last since uh, four to five years. And then uh, finally we ha have a first version for uh, quantitative GXPD test. And basically uh, for GXPD, GXPD test, we need some easy to use method and also uh, quantitative and also uh, room temperature, some storage. And that's very essential to use some country. Uh, therefore, we have developed some uh, POC quantitative GXPD test and it's called the standard GCSPD test. And as you know, uh, the, even though we have the product, we have to uh, test many sites to evaluate, uh, to ensure the quality. Uh, quality. And then uh, we are now processing uh, US FDA uh, registration for uh, GXPD push test. And also we have plan to uh, apply WHO PQ for GXPD POC test. And, and anyway, we are now uh, uh, developing more easy to use uh, second version GXPD test. Yeah, thank you. Okay, you just mentioned you are working on some other, some other products. So um, can you just quickly tell us a little bit about the different R&D focus areas for malaria diagnostics at SD Biosensors these days? What are you focusing on for the, for the coming years? Okay, uh, as you know, uh, uh, SD Biosensor is focused on development uh, uh, NTD RDT test including COVID-19. And uh, currently we are now producing many uh, uh, RDT tests, uh, including COVID and malaria and dengue HIV. And for the uh, more advanced malaria test, we are now developing a, a high sensitive malaria test. And also we have worked with the FIND uh, to develop a malaria and CRP combo test because uh, in case of high fever patient, we have to di differentiate uh, malaria infection and viral infection and bacterial infection. Therefore, find the gave us some idea to develop uh, malaria and also CRP combo test. Already we have a final product and then uh, now find an uh, SD biosensor uh, started to evaluate uh, uh, CRP and malaria test. And also, as you know, there are some uh, malaria HLP2, uh, especially PF mutant existed in the some field. Uh, we found out some many cases in uh, India. Uh, therefore, uh, we want to improve the malaria RD test to add uh, some, uh, some mutant cover antibody especially HLP2 mutant, and also some case uh, deletion of uh, HLP2 case. Uh, anyway, we are now developing uh, some uh, mutant new version malaria test. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cho. So maybe one or two more short questions to Dr. Zabine, and then I would like to engage with the audience. And I think there are lots of questions coming in, and I would like to address as many as possible for the remaining half or 25 minutes, I guess. So Dr. Sabine, so um, COVID-19 like malaria has fever as one of its main ingredients, so to say. So my <laughs> question to you is, how do we diagnose other fevers on the field? What tools and interventions do we need? Thank you. Thanks, Joost. Um, Yes, fever is really central to loads of diseases, I think, um, in Southeast Asia and actually around the world. So even before COVID-19 came on 
on, onto the stage. Um, there were also already a long list of, of, of things that could cause fever. Obviously, malaria has to be at the forefront of, of all these investigations. So malaria needs to be tested wherever you are and, and, and whenever, just to make sure it's not malaria and to treat appropriately, as Dr. Kamini said. Um, but then there's dengue, there's typhoid. Um, those ones we, we, I think everybody has heard of, but then there's also sort of less well-known causes of fever, which are rickettsial diseases, scrub typhus, murin typhus, there are leptospirosis, and then there's meliodosis. So there's a, there's a huge range of, of pathogens that cause febrile illnesses in the Asia Pacific region and, and, you know, up, including Australia. And so it's absolutely critical, um, have innovations to have good diagnostics for all of them to be differential and it comes back to the surveillance because obviously we cannot implement at every place in every setting in every village a whole panel of tests so we do need good surveillance to identify which tests we should be using um, so these things need to go hand in hand and then you know if you I'm a, I, I come from R&D so I would tell you and I, I'm absolutely convinced we need also more R&D more thought, more more investment into all of those different other pathogens that I've just mentioned, and some of them you might have never heard of, but um, but they trust me, they do cause fevers and they do cause mortality and morbidity in the region. So I think there's there's that there's we need innovation, we need to put money and, and thought into how we can improve the testing and and thinking innovatively, how can we put them in panels and and use them uh, and use the right one at the right place. Um, but then I think what is critical is political will, because you need to put these tests need to be, you know, we can we can have all of these innovations, we can have all of these tests, but if they don't have a place to be to go um, in the health system, and if they if 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 currently often our health systems are functioning what we call silos with so TB, malaria, um, HIV. And we need to really step back and think broadly and, and, and engage, you know, there would need to be political will from all the different, um, from the ministries of health, from the programs, from the funders, from, from many different organizations, from the procurement agencies to, to enable this sort of broader integrated approach to management of fevers, because there's lots of them out there and to be really treating the patients and, and capture all of them it's beyond just the innovation that we can do that requires money and push um, very smart R&D people, but there is a political will that needs to happen. And so that these tests really, you know, can be integrated into a health system that is ready and that is strong and that knows how to use them. Otherwise, the data that I mentioned right at the beginning that are critical to inform any public health intervention, um, you know they're not going to be there and they 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 can sort of you know they can't be used um and and so yeah i think there's 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 a lot in addition to the r d that we need to think of like really to sustainably implement this broader approach but i think we're all you know we've heard it in this panel and i think we've heard it in the context of of COVID. we're all sort of ready to do that um and i think we're, we're sort of at a good a good place right now to make that happen um because well, we've, we've learned a lot over the last couple of months. Thank you, Dr. Sabine. And maybe just a quick follow-up question, and then we go straight into our Q&A. Um, you talked about the innovations, and these innovations help the region fight existing and future infectious disease threats. Actually, can I just ask you your personal, professional opinion about how will these innovations actually help the region? I mean, what's your what's your a quick window into the future. Well, as I, I think, I, as I said, I think they they will be essential to the region to identify and monitor continuously what is happening right now and identify threats and to alert the whole, you know, individual countries, individual, you know, parts of countries, and the whole region to monitor threats to to know what is happening. But you know, one thing that I think we we have to never forget is that even as a new kid on the block like now there's COVID sometimes you know at some certain times of the year there's a lot of dengue um, and you know a lot of focus goes to that but what we really can't forget is that we need to keep testing for malaria and that we need to get somewhat test for all of them and I think the WHO guidelines I just want to you know point people that might not have seen them look at 
the current WHO guidelines for COVID-19 uh, management really clearly state that if, if you're in a malaria endemic setting, and if there's any reason that this could be another febrile cause of febrile illness, you do have to test for those as well, because they could be co-infections and that has to, and that is, you know, there's not either or, and, and that makes it more complicated. But I think we need to sort of, it also speaks again and um, to this more integrated look at things and, and to know what is happening in your, in your region, to surveillance, to good diagnostic infrastructures, and then, you know, political, political will to absorb all of these, all of these data and all of this information. So, um, Really, I encourage people to have a look at, at those recent guidelines from the WHO, which are really nicely illustrating that. And, and, and be, be, they're very, very clear on what we need to do to keep, you know, look at the new thing, but keep our eye on the old, old, old threats as well. Thank you very much to Sabine. Thank you to all the speakers for this first round. And I understand that the uh, Apple Mars Secretariat is sending out links in case someone refers to an interesting study or something. So I think there's a lot of happening in the chat and I saw a lot of questions when I looked uh, on the left of my desk. On the right, I see now a lot of questions coming in as well. So I would like to start with Arita-san. And uh, can you give an indication of the cost per test? And a second question, LAMP is also very sensitive and contamination is often an issue. How do you implement in a rural setting to eliminate this issue? So first, uh, we have fine negotiated price for all malaria test kits. So cost per test is 5.2 euros. So this is now available cost for our test kits. So the second point, contamination issue, is huge issue for all molecular diagnosis. What we do offer is not only technology and product, but also the training. How we can implement TB lamp, uh, TB lamp in rural site for TB diagnosis is uh, very similar to malaria. So we have plan for the training for microscopy operator for three days to understand what is the risk of contamination during text process. Mm -hmm. And then we offer not only the technology on site, but also via uh, video. So we do some training online and we are doing some TV training via the Zoom system in Zambia. This is what we are trying to do instead of doing our uh, the training on site. So once contamination appears, we have some troubleshooting video too, to remove contamination and also contamination risk by human uh, processes. Thank you. Thank you, Arita San. And can you tell us in one sentence something about the WHO pre-qualification um, status, please? Okay, so since we have good communication with Global Malaria Program, we have been uh, suggested and also um, supported by WHO to do some additional study in uh, elimination area and uh, also sub-Sahara where most uh, malaria uh, exists. So we are planning to do some additional study by using such uh, support and also collaborator in many countries and collect the data and make our quality of evidence higher and higher to be adapted by WHO. This is our plan. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Um, how soon can SD Biosensor get WHO pre-qualification for the malaria CRP rapid diagnostic test? Uh, up to now, there is no some guideline for uh, WHPQ uh, malaria and CRP combo test. And for the more some accumulation of data, we need some more clinical evaluation. Uh, therefore, we already got the uh, fund from Rice Fund. And then we are working with the FIND to make uh, some uh, clinical evaluation in some country, Cambodia and Myanmar. And then after getting the 
some real data uh, with the CRP and uh, some malaria combo test. And then we uh, analyze some data and also uh, we can estimate uh, some our CRP and malaria test usage. And then uh, we uh, can discuss with the WHO through find and then uh, that time maybe we can make some WHO picking. A question to Dr. Cho and maybe to Arita San, maybe the last one for a moment. Um, where are we now in the R&D stage for more sensitive Vivex RDTs and how does the malaria RDT landscape look like going forward given the high need for COVID RDTs? To me, to me. Oh, for the uh, COVID uh, antigen high sensitive test, uh, already we have developed more than uh, 3,000 uh, more than 3,000 monocantibody against uh, nuclear capsid of uh, COVID-19 virus, and then we pick up the best pair to develop the antigen test. Currently, uh, we are very uh, happy to. Uh, get to some high sensitive uh, COVID antigen test, but still we are now developing uh, more monocantibody to increase the sensitivity. And also currently we are now developing a saliva test uh, because uh, everybody want to, uh, want to uh, some more sensitive uh, COVID. And also, and also we are now developing also uh, malaria bivax PLDH high sensitive an antibody to increase the uh, bivax sensitivity. And I think uh, we can increase uh, bivax sensitivity around uh, two times or some four times uh, high sensitive bivax test also by using a uh, uh, PLDH. Arita-san, any, any other views? So thank you very much for your question. So as I explained, our lamp technology for malaria is uh, high sensitive. That means in cell leaf, one parasite per microliter can be detected. So unfortunately, we don't have any plan to do any reagent for ultra high sensitive, which is in definition 0.1 parasite per ml, uh, per uh, microliter. So a uh, second point, COVID-19, Aiken has already launched the product in Japan only for COVID-19. The detection limit is 60 copies per sample. So this is what we have right now in Japan. Thank you, Arita-san. Thank you, Dr. Cho. I go maybe over to to um, Dr. Kamini and Dr. Tang. I got a question for, he, for you from our audience. What are the gaps in terms of diagnostics in your respective countries? So what are the gaps in your, for diagnostics in your respective countries? Who would like to go first? Dr. Tang, you go first? Okay. Um, so, I think the gap uh, in terms of uh, diagnostics uh, in my country. Um, so first thing is um, how to detect uh, asymptomatic malaria, asymptomatic transmission. And then, because if the people, they don't have the symptom, they, uh, don't go to the health facility, and then we, we cannot detect the uh, parasite and cannot give treatment. So it's make the transmit, uh, transmission uh, is going on. And also for the um, law um, parasitemia. Uh, so if uh, very low uh, density, then uh, the uh, conventional tests could not be taken. So that's why we, we always uh, need a high sensitivity RDT or un even uncha sensitivity RDT uh, to detect more cases. 
and um, uh, we also concerns more of uh, RDT to detect malaria in Vietnam is supported by Global Fund. So when Global Fund gone, then that mean it's hard for us to 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 buy uh, RDT to detect malaria in uh, the country. And that's why uh, at the moment we still use um, microscopy. So microscopy um, risk slide to detect malaria. But um, the gap here is how to maintain the quality of uh, uh, microscopy, microscopy research here. Because now malaria going down and uh, uh, the techniques here not always uh, read the slide. So they lose their uh, skin, lose their ability to detect. So I think that is, is the gap and that is the challenges uh, for Vietnam national program. Mm. Professor Kamini, what um, are your gaps? Mm. Yes, thank you. So uh, you asked about my country and that's Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka has eliminated malaria, so there's no longer transmission in this country. However, there are malaria patients being detected here every year, say about 50 to 100 cases of imported malaria. People who get, uh, get malaria overseas and then come to, the, to Sri Lanka and then they're diagnosed there. So one, I think one of the greatest limitations we have today in, detect, in, in, in diagnos diagnostics for malaria is um, uh, not being able to have a quantitative point of care, reliable test for G6PD deficiency to detect uh, G6PD deficiency. You know, there's a lot of vivax malaria in the Southeast Asia region, much more than falciparum now. So most of the imported malaria cases that come from India and, and other countries in the region happen to be vivax. So we need better diagnostics for vivax. I, I was glad to hear that there is a lot of work going on on improving vivax diagnostics sensitivity, rapid diagnostics, and um, G6PD deficiency is definitely a big gap detecting it. I think these are the, the major, major gaps today uh, for the, not just for Sri Lanka, but for the whole of the Southeast Asia region. Thank you, Dr. Tang. Thank you, Dr. Kamini. Question from the audience to Dr. Zabina. Malaria has been developed as a vertical program for many decades now. As we now talk about integrated management and strengthened health systems, we are talking about more horizontal programming. How are we to make this transition and how to finance it? I think that's a difficult one. <laughs> yeah, that's a really difficult one. And I wish I had an answer, if I'm honest. I think, um, I think this kind of discussion, realizing that this is what we need is what... Um, what is critical um, and I think it's the it's actually at this point right now that I feel this kind of discussion is happening more than before and more realistically you know even you know I come back to COVID but just as an example you know the the guy like suddenly in the context of coronavirus we are talking about all these other diseases as well we are talking about even non-communicable diseases in terms of risk factors if you know the the, the guidelines from the WHO clearly state you should test for diabetes so so there is a I think there's a there's a shift there's a there's a movement in thinking about this more um as as an integrated way of looking at things that we have to look at things so how do we make this transition you know what you know being based in Geneva having these conversations at the you know WHO and at Global Fund often what what I hear is well if we get a request from the country we can buy that test or we can you know we can do things so I, I, I think being vocal about it and in from from having this shift and this discussion and the will within the country because it's 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 not easy you know the country structures but having changing everything um, I mean but but having that shift and, and and having starting to push these discussion upwards and and so that they're actually coming from that it's not a, um, a not, not a, a sort of downwards you know the the sort of global 
global institutions are sort of putting this on countries. I think it has to come from countries and from the initiatives from countries to to vocalize this. And then I do think there's the will the will to to make a shift. How this is financed, how um, how, how this is actively being transitioned, you know. I don't have the answer to that, but I know that there's a lot of discussions about sustainable financing, about innovative ways of financing for global health. Um, and, and, and that needs to be harnessed and that needs to be brought together. So I, I think it needs to be, all these conversations need to be brought together. And I know that they're happening, um, you know, when it comes to how to the financing, um, I might not be the best person to answer that, but mm -hmm. um, it, it is a big push and it's a, a big thing to do, but you know, all of these challenges are big, so we need to just start start somewhere. Okay, thank you, Sabina. So I'm gonna ask a question to all of you, but uh, I have a double question for Sydney. So first a question for Sydney, and then you also start the round for the final question, because I'm looking at the time and I think we're running out of it. We have only 10 minutes left. So um, Dr. Sydney, in addition to the widely used malaria additives, which other tests do you think are critical to support fever management also in times of COVID-19? And then sec second question to all of you, and I would like to hear short answers, your, your professional opinion, is actually, um, is there um, a possibility in European to have self-testing kits for COVID-19? And what about self-testing for malaria? So this is a question I got on my uh, question channel I have. So let's, Sydney first, the first part. So which other tests do you do you think are critical support fever management also in types of COVID-19? And then what about self-testing for COVID as well as for malaria? Okay, so uh, maybe the first question first, um, what other tests? Uh, I, I would probably come from not so much the specific test, but um, the characteristic uh, I think, you know, could be useful. Or the context of what we're looking at. Um, I, I think um, uh, Zabina touched on it a couple of times in terms of uh, uh, data information uh, helping to make inform um, decision and change uh, or, or manage policy making and things. So all that is actually driven by data and as a result we maybe need to think of a way to build more efficient connectivity uh, so that there's a, almost a real-time connectivity and, uh, and, and, and data uh, uh, information. Um, so I say that in the context of, because um, we talked a lot, a lot about RDT uh, today. So, you know, can we build some of that into the, the point of care test? Um, obviously, if it is a lab-based test, it's already inbuilt, that, that sort of connectivity and information. So, so from that perspective, and the other uh, angle is, um, uh, I, I think Dr. Kamini talked about this uh, as well, of this, uh, and also Zabina, uh, the co-infection that we, we often forget, especially in this pandemic, everyone is thinking about COVID-19, we forget. And in uh, every single product that we, we, we advise people to use, we always make sure that we advise that, that just because it is not tested positive for COVID-19 doesn't mean that you know, it is not um, uh, positive for something else. Just because it is uh, positive for dengue doesn't mean that the patient is not co-infected for uh, 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 COVID-19 as well. So, so what that means is um, uh, we got to think about maybe a trade-off between uh, uh, having a large enough panel to look at the different types of uh, uh, disease indication uh, versus the convenience of having uh, uh, of being able to do that at point of care. So the convenience of that. Um, and incorporating the large panel of being able to do that at point of care. So those are the two sort of general characteristics uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I, I would think maybe additional, um, um, you know, tools to have uh, in the world of testing. Um, as to your second question, self-testing, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, perhaps I'm less familiar in the context of malaria, but in the context of COVID-19, everybody is talking about that, the self-testing. Um, I, I think uh, perhaps uh, the difference is, is this, um, COVID-19 is new. Um, <laughs> there's there's a, lot, a lot of things that we don't know about it. So when we talk about self-testing, there's this, um, you know, there's this unknownness about 
what is the transmissibility, the infectivity? And COVID-19, similar to malaria, we are talking about pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic, and symptomatic, and they are all infective. So it's not like pre and asymptomatic, you know, patients are not infected. So, um, you know, so when we apply that concept of uh, self-testing to a new virus, uh, it's very, very different. I think we should be a lot more careful in terms mm -hmm. of that. Thank you, Dr. Sidney. Dr. Cho, short answer on my question about self-testing. Yes, yes. Uh... Uh, uh, in case of COVID infection, there are so many different figures in individually. It goes uh, around 50% uh, not exact, uh, around 50% asymptomatic. But uh, even though asymptomatic patient, infection person can secret uh, huge uh, some virus, virus, uh, virus, virus to another person and then uh, anyway, uh, COVID infection is very difficult to diagnosis of uh, infection status because uh, uh, some some case are symptomatic, some case symptomatic, uh, and also even though symptomatic case, the symptom is very similar to general cough and the other viral infection, and therefore, uh, basically, we need some easy to use and also accurate test for self-testing. That's very essential. And uh, everybody want to know, want to uh, saliva test for personal use. But yep. we have to uh, check some uh, virus concentration uh, compared to some nasopharyngeal uh, swab. Because uh, uh, even though uh, we have some saliva test, if the test sensitivity is low, that's a big problem. Yeah, therefore, uh, we need some uh, deep, uh, clinical evaluation with the saliva test. And also, recently, we uh, have evaluated many sites, uh, including antigen and antibody combo. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, as you know, in uh, first, after infection, uh, or some uh, after symptom onset, uh, within one week, uh, mostly antigen is working very well, but most some cases are symptomatic. Therefore, uh, infection patients uh, they didn't know what what time they infect. Therefore, some case uh, antibody positive. In the case, antigen uh, generally negative. Therefore, okay. I strongly recommend to use antigen antibody combo for self test. That time maybe we can use saliva or nasal swab for antigen test and also antibody test we can recommend the finger stick test so thank you dr cho i'm realizing i'm asking a question where is no there's no easy answer and already your brains are moving and thinking about it i getting the warning that we are running out of time so but i just want to have uh, i to ask you now this question again as a futurist question and you just say yes or no are we going to have a self-test for malaria and for, for COVID-19 um, in one year from now? Arita-san, self-test for COVID-19 one year from now, yes or no? Um, yeah. Unfortunately, this is difficult. No, I, we, I we are trying to uh, <laughs> okay. However, uh, for self-testing, we need to do some additional okay. evaluation, not only for lab professionals, but also all patients or let's say, for over-the-counter uh, over use. That takes time. Okay, thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Chang. Yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah. If you can, you can uh, uh, do that, it's very good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Kamini, so are we going to have a, a self-test? I, I mean, I believe so. I think yes. And there's a very small place for self-testing for malaria in special groups like travelers and people who work in forests and so on. But I wouldn't say self-testing is important for the okay. general malaria population as such. Thank you, Dr. Kamini. And Zabina, you are doing R&D, you always find. So you're at the last... last well, I think... 
I think technically, yes, if it, you know, it depends where, how you implement it and, and for which groups, as Dr. Carmody says, I think technology wise, that's maybe not the problem. Linkage to care is critical for mm. self-tests. Thank you very much for all your, your sharing your thoughts and your, your expertise. Um, before we're going to finish, I want to hand over to Dr. Marie Lamy one more time. And I asked her actually to help me to distill maybe three key messages from today's conversation. And I give her a generous, probably one to two minutes. Um, Dr. Marie, please. Thank you, Joost. Um, so first, I'd just like to thank our guests today for their insights on the topic of diagnostics. Um, all of you came at it from very different perspectives. And to me, it was really interesting to hear from you, um, you know, why and how diagnostics are really key to infectious disease management. Um, and also to hear from you what innovations are needed to support regional health security beyond what we already have. So by way of a very quick summary, it won't do justice to the level of detail you shared with us today. Um, I just want to share three main takeaways. Um, for me, what seems clear from the discussion today is that if we want to get to elimination of malaria by 2030 in the first place, in addition to the tools that we already have at hand, which are great um, to detect cases, we, we really need new diagnostic tests, more sensitive ones to detect the last cases in the region. Um, as a second point, what I also understood is that it's not just about research and development, it's also about access and getting those tools to the health workers and to the patients down the line. And so with that, you know, decision makers, policymakers across ministries really have a role to play here to introduce some of these new tools more rapidly, whether it's from registration at the regulatory level um, or the financing procurement of these tools and also their effective distribution and use on the ground. Um, you know, Sabina mentioned political will. I think that that's really a key word here that we need to remember as well. And then finally, as a, as a third point, um, what we heard is that diagnosing fevers in silos won't really work in the long run. Uh, if someone with a fever approaches a health worker and tests negative for malaria, what then? Could it be COVID-19? Could it be dengue? So we've alluded to the importance of integrated fever management. And I think in the long term, this approach could both help sustain our efforts towards elimination and also improve our preparedness for future outbreaks of infectious diseases in the Asia Pacific region. So for this reason, um, I think it's really essential that we all continue to work together across organizations, agencies, different ministries, and also across borders um, to improve access to health innovations. And that includes, of course, diagnostics and to continue to support the development and the introduction as well of new tools that can help improve health security here in Asia Pacific. Um, so, you know, with that, I really look forward to the feedback from the audience on this roundtable, to hearing from you on how we can make um, these discussions even more relevant to you in the future. Uh, there'll be a survey circulated after this, um, so do keep an eye out for that. I know that we've not been able to answer all of your great questions as well during the Q&A session, uh, but we will endeavor to address those by email after the roundtable. You can also uh, contact us at info at applema.org. If you have other burning questions, feel free to do so anytime. And as a last point, yes, I'll just mention very quickly that um, you can check out um, our social media accounts, including the Appleman Facebook page, where we'll be sharing information on some of the different tools, existing and new innovations um, that exist in terms of diagnostics to support the malaria elimination efforts. So that's it for me. I'll turn it back to you, Jost. Thanks again uh, to everybody yes. for participating. Thank you, Dr. Marie. And uh, thank you very much to all the speakers today. Thank you very much to all the attendees today. So this is all we've got for you today. I hope our audience, our listeners had some interesting takeaways from our first edition of the Malaria Game Changer series. The next one, I think there's gonna be a slide to be seen. will continue in August on, I think there's a date for me. Ah, yeah, here it is. On the 21st of August, the next round table on vector control tools for Asia and the Pacific. We are going to have, again, a number of very interesting guests from different uh, backgrounds. So thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to all of you. Have a good day.
stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.